And we are live. Oh, it's a countdown. All right. Hello, my name is Joshua Gilliland, and I'm one of the founding attorneys of the Legal Geeks. Thank you for joining us today for This is the Law, our in-depth look at the Mandalorian, or as we like to say, the Mandalorian, and have a lot of fun with legal analysis of a Star Wars show that might just be everything I love about this wonderful series. <laughs> with us today are Thomas Harper, who is an Army JAG officer now in private practice, Gabby Martin, who uh, is ma helping make the world a better place in the great state of Connecticut, <laughs> and Megan Hitchcock, who is a trial attorney down in uh, Southern California, who I went to law school with. So we're going to have a lot of fun today. And if you have questions, please type them in. Uh, we want to thank Get Vocal and our friends at uh, Force Fest for asking us to participate. Uh, Force Fest is doing a lot of good trying to raise money for uh, Make a Wish down in Los Angeles. And if you've seen all the good people at the Make a Wish Foundation on how they help children who are, you know, in need, suffering, and give them opportunities. Uh, it's truly a wonderful experience, and Star Wars fans really know how to help others because that's the purpose of these stories. It's about doing the right thing, and Make a Wish really does that. So let's get into the big legal issues from Mandalorian. So I'm going to bring up our slides, and let's begin. So we're going to talk about custody issues, contract law, tort law, and of course, it's not Star Wars without talking about war crimes. So let's talk about custody of the child. <laughs> now, we, we have the armorer uh, uh, say to the Mandalorian, a founding, foundling is in your care. By creed, until it is of age or reunited with its own kind, you are as its father. This is the way. Well, can the Mandalorian adopt the child and actually be his dad? And in California, the answer would be no, because the parent has to be 10 years older than the adoptive child. And since the infant is 50, that's highly problematic. Sure, if the species ages differently and might not be biologically look like a 50-year-old, he's still 50. And the Mandalorian is not 50, so it's highly problematic. So, no, he can't adopt, but there is this thing called guardianship, and there's no requirement on age for being someone's guardian. And we actually did a mock uh, uh, guardianship petition at San Diego Comic Fest in March before everything happened in the before times. And <laughs> there's a high probability we had the best attended live panel for Star Wars in 2020 because of the before <laughs> times. <laughs> but Megan, can you help us understand, you know, what else needs to happen in order for the Mandalorian to be appointed the child's guardian? Well, to be a child's guardian, it has to be in the best interests of the child. Um, so everything must be in the best interest of the child. Um, also, uh, <clears throat> the, well, <laughs> the, the guardian has to uh, be able to take care of the, of the child uh, who at Comic-Con or Comic Fest actually was called Lucas. Uh, and it looks like that the Mandalorian has the best interests of the child. Uh, you know, he's got a best, uh, a bulletproof stroller and um, he does want to take care of him. Problem is he's going to have to take care of him for 400 years or more. That's what he's agreeing to do. Um, so it, it's a long, it's a long guardianship uh, since the child is only 50 at this point. Um, but uh, he, he does look to be an apt guardian. He can take care of him. He seems to get him fed with frogs and things um, or with soup. 
uh, and he does look like he can take after his best interests. I mean, he does have the bulletproof uh, stroller that follows him around, so he is in good hands. And to build on that, this sort of hearing would be opposed. And if you want to imagine what an opposition petition would look like, because you had Child Protective Services or the investigating agency actually do a home study and go like, so yeah, you have his little bedroom quotes by your armory? That, ah, uh, and your job is hunting people down and you freeze them in carbon and not carbonite? They're, that's, that's a really dangerous job. Now, when you think about the fact that there are space Nazis trying to hunt the child down and harvest his essence or biology or something horrible, you know, you want someone who has the skill set to uh, kill war criminals if they're attacking you. So on that level, there, there is a certain uh, attraction to having the Mandalorian as the guardian. Uh, but we're going to take a deeper look at this as we get into the child endangerment issues. And Gabby, can you <laughs> help us understand any problems with uh, how the child proof the razor crest? Yeah. Um, first of all, like you said, he is he is not does not have the best home care situation um, because he is in a closet uh, by a um, armory. Um, a lot of weapons, a lot of, um, you know, in and out people, not the most savory of characters. Um, so child endangerment is the is wanton and reckless conduct that creates a serious bodily injury to a child. So the, on the other hand, you can have a duty to act and wanting or reckless, wantingly or recklessly failing to take reasonable steps to alleviate the risk to the child. So the key word here is the, the wanton and reckless conduct. So is he acting wanton and recklessly by putting him in this, this closet? Probably not. That may be the only living space. We haven't seen much of the Razor Crest on season one. Um, that may be really the only place um, for him to sleep. Um, and it is small. It is it is enough for him. And he does seem to have blankets and such in there. So, you know, maybe relative to a spaceship that is, you know, um, the appropriate uh, room area for a small individual. Um, Matt, it would also be um, the person has to also be aware of and consciously disregard any risks to the child, which he does not seem to, except when you get into um, the episode where he they he leaves him in the hot vehicle um, in the hot razor crest on a desert planet. This is not great. This was not his best parenting moment. Um, only 20 states have laws that make it illegal to leave a, to a child unattended in a vehicle. Uh, charges, depending on the state, can range from a class A misdemeanor to a felony. Um, and in Florida, you cannot leave a child under the age of six unattended or unsupervised in a motor vehicle. So that obviously we have a child here that's 50, so that wouldn't apply. Um, but you are putting the health of the child in danger. And clearly when baby Yoda stumbles out of the razor crest, he appears to be in significant distress that his guardian is not around. Um, so I think you could find that he did leave. He may be guilty of at least a very minor misdemeanor for leaving uh, Baby Yoda unattended in the hot razor crest. Look, I, as the father of two little girls, I have some <laughs> spare like baby locks and stuff. It seems like the razor crest is the most unsecured ship in the galaxy, other than maybe the Millennium Falcon. Mm -hmm. And so I would happily go yeah. some of those. <laughs> Oh, yeah. and, and as for the closet, Harry Potter lived in a closet until he was 11. So, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Exhibit A, Your Honor. Character building. <laughs> you know, in, in, the, Character building. in defense of the Mandalorian, that's a compartment. It's not a closet. So <laughs> it's like that's what you have on ships. It's it's a little birthing state room with, with bunks in it. It's He's not in a closet. So... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The closet is in the eye of the beholder. Hell. <laughs> At least he's not frozen in carbonite. So, uh, Thomas, <laughs> let's talk about how complicated profession bounty hunting is. And is it okay for them just to shoot people? 
Yeah, so the the idea of bounty hunting in Star Wars is you know goes all the way back. Um, you know, we knew Han had a, a bounty on his head uh, in A New Hope, so it's, the concept has been there, but it's very different than concept in the real world. Bounty hunting and and the folks that do that, bail bondsmen or bail uh, agents, whatever the the state chooses to call them are tied to just that, the act of bail and the failure to, or the, the, the jumping of bail. In other words, somebody that violates the terms of their bail. Bail itself is a concept that goes way, 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 way back, uh, hundreds of years. Originally, you know, we think of bail right now as, as cash. You know, you put down collateral and you're allowed to go. If you, it, you go free before your trial, if you bust the terms of that bail, you forfeit the money or the property, whatever you've put up as collateral. Well, bail used to be people, right? So somebody would vouch for you. You would be the bail. And if uh, Bailey didn't show up, you got to hang from the gallows. That all changed in the late 1600s uh, in, in England. They passed something called the Habeas Corpus Act, and it allowed uh, money or property to be put up as bail. Fast forward all the way in the United States. Uh, it's enshrined in the Constitution. You can't have um, unreasonable bail. That's under the Eighth Amendment. Uh, and then the actual creation of our judiciary system sort of defined, uh, flesh that idea out a little more. But the idea of actually allowing somebody to, to pursue, uh, you know, a, bail, a, a bailed person, somebody who's jumped bail, that didn't become legal until the Supreme Court case way in the late 1700s. Um, and it, it's, it's funny that this, this entire practice, this cottage industry traces its roots back to this uh, this. A Supreme Court case, albeit in dicta, uh, not in an, in an actual holding, in other words, found that uh, individuals could go out, they could act, uh, you know, pseudo law enforcement is a, a, a stretch because that's not what they are, but they could act as an agent of the, the bail bondsman in order to bring that person back. And so the, the idea, and we see that play out in The Mandalorian, we see him accept a... Uh, uh, or we see him cycle through and deny or refuse a lot of uh, low bounties for for bail jumpers. You, it, grief is putting out puck after puck, bail jumper, bail jumper, bail jumper. That's what bounty hunting is in the United States. And unfortunately, it's not. I think the term bounty hunting is not really used. I, I think it's it's the the common phrase, like what everybody knows it by. But it differs. Most states don't call them that because that sounds like a little murdery or a little like Star Warsy. Most <laughs> states call them the bail bondsman agents. It's the like these sanitized titles that they have, um, and, and that's their function. They go out and chase these folks down. And so I like that the Mandalorian has has introduced a little bit of that. It's it's funny that the thing that most resembles our bail system uh, and and bounty hunting in the United States is the, like the low dollar. Those are the low dollar bounties that Din Djarin really doesn't want. They're not like worth the, the, the pool in the galaxy. And then when we talk about the actual use of force, because what is his uh, favorite catchphrase? I can bring you in warm or I can bring in cold. Well, cold doesn't necessarily mean frozen in carbonite. Cold means dead, right? And <laughs> there's this, this ingrained... Um, ability that, that is just like seared into Star Wars storytelling uh, going all the way back of a bounty hunter in the Star Wars universe to be able to kill somebody, right? You see it when Greedo confronts Han in the cantina. Uh, he's fine to get, to take the uh, the dead version of the bounty instead of the alive reward. Uh, you see it uh, in, in um, Empire Strikes Back and, and, and other materials. And uh, certainly you see the Mandalorian consider killing folks in this one. Well, in our legal system, uh, it, it's virtually unheard of for a, a, a bail agent or a, you know, a real world bounty hunter to be able to kill someone. You always retain the ability to defend yourself, right? So you can use force in self-defense. So if you feel that you are being attacked or something like that, uh, you can use force that's equal to the threat that you face. Deadly force is really restricted. Uh, it, it's uh, only in circumstances where you feel that your life or you're, you're at risk of uh, loss of life or serious bodily injury in most states. And for a bounty hunter to get in, into that sort of situation, I think is a little limited. Um, 
most often what you see is they create the, the danger, right? The bounty hunter is the one that sort of instigates the, the conflict, whether it's Boba Fett chasing down Han Solo or Din chasing down, uh, you know, a, the, the Mithral in, in episode one. And when you're the, the instigator of the violence under the law, you lose your protection. You can't start the fight and then end it with a blaster bolt to the head or in that, uh, that one Quarren's case, uh, a door to the torso. So unfortunately for Din, he's, he's going to be really restricted in his use. The, the interesting thing here is he explicitly doesn't use force uh, to, to collect um, the child. He, he had the ability to kill the child, but, but chose not to, and in fact saved his life at the end of uh, the, the first episode there. And I want to raise with that, because we have IG at the end of the episode say that, something to the effect of that it was a kill order. Well, that turns IG-11 from bounty hunter to hitman or mercenary, and that's problematic because we don't, yeah, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. Like we, we don't have bounty hunters go out and kill people because that's murder for hire, and that's what the mob does. It's not what <laughs> we have as our legal system of yeah, um, instead of bringing them in, just bump them off for me. So, yeah, it, I mean, it is a crime. It is a crime to con <laughs> to to have a conspiracy to commit murder. Like that is itself a crime to hire a hitman. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it, is the, it is the imperial remnant that's hiring. Yeah. Let's not forget, it is the Imperial <laughs> Remnant that's doing the hiring here. So it's not out of character for them to put a kill order on a toddler. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like if they blew up a planet, killing a baby is really, it, it's tough for yeah. them to move up on how that's to be That's a horrible. Monday, right? <laughs> yeah, after, <laughs> yeah, after A New Hope, it's really hard for them to do anything more egregious after blowing up a planet with billions of people. But uh, let's move into the issue of contract law. And uh, to break that down, Megan and I are going to IG-11 the Mandalorian entering into a contract during a shootout. And this is just fun because it brings back memories of Professor Royer at McGeorge and the wonderful <laughs> world of uh, contract formation, offer, acceptance, consideration, and performance. Yeah, we can hear all the the lawyers and current law students just cringing over flashbacks to one L contracts right now. Like it was Recoil. heard around the world. <laughs> yeah, just like ah. there are no peppercorns <laughs> in this hypothetical, but there is an IG unit. And uh, Megan, do you want to help us understand what was the agreement and whether or not there was mutual assent to all the terms? Um, well, Josh, this is actually your topic. Oh. <laughs> Not I'm going to it. Well, <laughs> I will just keep going. So the answer to that is there was an agreement for splitting the reward, but there was not an ag agreement about uh, IG-11 getting the reputation credits. And I don't know if that's monetary or like karma points in a role-playing game. Like that's never really explained on what it is. But that term is never agreed to. This also raises the issue of can you have a contract with a computer or artificial intelligence? And there's actually been discussions about that legally with uh, stock trading, that there are some AI uh, programs that are created to facilitate stock trading faster than a human could process the ability to go, hey, let's let's buy oranges because of the, uh, you know, there's gonna be a freeze in Florida, just doing the trading places type, type theme. And that could get interesting on whether or not computers can actually form contracts. So this gets into my issue of droid rights and why I do think IG-11 might be my favorite droid now, uh, but it is something to discuss. Now let's talk about another issue with contracts and that's terms of payment. And Gabby, you know, we have uh, the Mandalorian get back with all of his bounties and Griff Carta is changing the terms of payment. Uh, 
-hmm. Is that okay, contractually speaking? It is not. Um, and it, it, well, I should, I should roll that back and I should give the, the very traditional lawyer answer, which is it depends. Um, mm -hmm. It depends on what they agreed upon, because clearly uh, we see that Mando is is a little pissed off when Grief offers him the Imperial credits. Um, and this, it, it would depend on what they agreed upon before, because if they agreed um, it, on the exact forms of payment and Grief is now changing it, that's a material breach. A form of payment, a term of payment is a material uh, port, a material um provision of a contract. And so it seems like maybe it was on Mando if they didn't agree to it to kind of say, hey, you can't use these Imperial credits, which have been no good for at least a couple years now, you know, that you have to have some form of currency that is good, that is tradable um, and not just some you know leftovers right this this seems these imperial credits seem to have the value of like monopoly money to mando um so you it really goes to the the point that you need to uh specify in a contract what you're uh agreeing upon what terms you're agreeing upon and especially the payment if there's multiple forms of payment involved you see this in international contracts um, you know, you'd want to specify over, you know, U.S. dollars versus pounds versus euros um, because those have different trading values. Right. So they did ha have um, different um, amounts based on um, the value of the dollar and based on stock markets. So you're, you're going to want to clarify that. So it, it may have been an oversight of Mando, honestly, to not specify that when they originally contracted. He did a really good Watto impression in refusing to accept those credits, though. <laughs> I, I, I think that was a, probably a very deep cut, like, reference. <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, Megan, let's talk about Sanctuary and yes. the, the issue of fail, failing to, do, to disclose a material fact, and this material fact being an ATST and there are no Ewoks to kill that thing. So can you walk us through whether or not a breach on the farmer's part to not disclose that fact? I can, I can. So this is a episode straight out of Magnum PI um, where the Mandalorians asked to provide security services in exchange for logic. So if we, um, <clears throat> You have to go back to the formation of their contract, which is, uh, you know, was this contract to provide security services uh, it, against the Raiders in exchange for lodging? Is that uh, an actual contract? And was that valid? So going to Hawaiian law, <laughs> um, a landlord and a tenant may agree to any consideration not otherwise prohibited as law, as rent. So under that, security services, uh, are okay. A uh, contract for security services for lodging is valid. However, there may be an issue with it not being in writing. Now, um, there's the issue of not having them disclose about the <laughs> ATST. So there are four situations where you have a duty to speak about a material fact. And one of those is it may be um, directly imposed by statute or other prescriptive law. Um, there's a, it may be voluntary assumed by a contractual undertaking. Uh, it may arise as an incident of a relationship between the defendant and the plaintiff. Uh, and it may arise as the result of other conduct by the defendant that makes it wrongful for him to remain silent. Here, the elements of concealment are that the defendants must have concealed or suppressed a uh, material fact, meaning that the villagers would have uh, concealed or suppressed a material fact. Yes, they did. But, uh, and were they under a duty to disclose that material fact? Well, probably. Um, the, uh, the, the third part of this, though, is did they intentionally conceal it with the intent to defraud Mando? I don't think so. I don't think they did it saying, like, <laughs> we're going to get him to help us and we're not going to tell them. I think they just were either uh, 
they unknowingly um, did it or they were just clueless or they didn't intend to defraud him. Um, also, the uh, Mando would have had to be unaware of the fact that of this fact and he wouldn't have acted as he did um, if he'd known. So I think regardless if he'd known about the ATSD or if he didn't, he still would have done the same thing. Uh, so I don't think it's a uh, an issue of um, him not being able to act the same his, way. His first, uh, his first so, reaction that I love is like, go find a new planet. <laughs> There's one yeah, ATSD yeah, in the world. Exactly. You got to go. Well, it's, it's a big galaxy. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, this did require an immediate contract modification and it did require him and uh, Cara Dune to change their strategy. But overall, I, I believe that, uh, you know, this didn't, this wasn't, it, while it was a material fact, it was not intentional. So I think uh, it did not go ahead and void the contract i don't know that they knew what an atst was at all i think they might there's a good chance that I, the villagers might have thought it was a big animal because when he said yeah. when it, he says possible. the word atst they're like what's an atst like, that's you just like we're just using our silly names right. now um you know <laughs> like between the red eyes and the paint cool. scheme you know it's possible <laughs> they just thought it was a big beast that had nothing to do with the raiders yeah Totally and, true. And totally true. So. This was the equivalent kind of, of, you know, to the, what was it, um, Fixer Upper show when they always stumbled upon some major disaster in the house that neither the homeowners nor the, the contractors knew about. And, you know, really, if you don't know about something on either party, there really can't be a breach. It's, it's kind of a surprise that comes out of nowhere. So... Well, and it is the way for him to, you know, help. So he was helping. And so he did what he was going to do anyway. Yes. And uh, yes. Now let's talk about what, what some say are disgusting creatures, but maybe they're just misunderstood. And that's, uh, you know, Thomas, is it okay? Just C-3PO to is perhaps the least tolerant droid in the galaxy. <laughs> At least my company was. <laughs> but yeah, this... Uh, I, we just had to mention the word Jawas, and I guarantee you this scene popped into everybody's head. It's playing as I speak. Uh, the, the setup is that uh, our our great hero now, well, we, we don't know that he's a total hero at that point, but Din is escorting the child back. He's he saved his life from these, uh, these evil mercenaries, and he comes upon a bluff looking over the Razor Crest only to find that he's been bested by a small clan of Jawas that has completely disassembled the Razor Crest and is uh, <laughs> a, a very efficient job of taking those parts, loading them onto the same crawler and leaving. His reaction, uh, we would call that aggressive negotiations because he pulls out his phase pulse <laughs> rifle and starts disintegrating them immediately. And so what we have is a use of deadly force to protect property. And I already talked about the, the use of deadly force to protect yourself. Every state has some form of law that, that recognizes the ability to defend yourself up to and including with deadly force. But that's not the situation we're in here. If you re remember, just play that scene in your head. When the job was fire back, he's the one that fired first and blew up one of their counterparts. They're firing wildly with their, um, their blasters. They're not coming in anywhere near him. They're not posing any sort of uh, deadly threat that, that would in any way allow him to use deadly force uh, in a legally justifiable way. So really what he's firing that rifle again and again to do is to defend his ship, to get his parts back. And 49 out of the 50 states in the U.S. do not recognize the ability of somebody to use deadly force to protect property. There is one state that does allow the use of deadly force to protect property. And I'll give you uh, like one guess in your brain as to which state that is. It starts with a T and ends with Texas. <laughs> Texas. <laughs> Texas uh, oh, I was, I was going gonna, was gonna to agree with Amanda and say my home state. I was too. I was gonna Florida or Texas. Yeah. <laughs> if, you're, if your fan boat or your anaconda is being stolen in Florida, then you can use deadly force. But um, no, but Texas allows deadly force to, to protect um movable physical like tangible property so if somebody's stealing your boat you know on its trailer uh you could do that 
But that doesn't help the, the Mandalorian here because in a weird quirk of that Texas law, it's got to be at night to be able to do that. And if you remember that scene, it's bright and sunny on Armada 7 as he opens fire on these Jawas. So it's really legally indefensible for him, even in the great state of Texas, which I guess there are parts of Texas that probably look like Arvala 7 there. But even in that state, uh, the Mandalorian is going to be out of luck. And, and what you're looking at is murder. <laughs> or, you know, some variant of it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a disturbing scene. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Well, on... On that note of, uh, you know, we have a scene in, in the final episode where the Mandalorian's been injured and he doesn't want his helmet taken off uh, in order to be treated. And, and Gabby, can you talk to us about refusing medical treatment? Yeah, so he is refusing, when he refuses to take off his helmet, um, and there's a whole conversation about, um, you know, the Mandalorians that precedes this scene um, about the Mandalorians not being a, a race of people, that it's a creed, that it's a religion. Um, so basically, when he refuses to take off his helmet because um, this is part of his creed, his way of life, um, he is refusing uh, medical treatment on the grounds of on religious grounds. And this is something that we've seen, um, you know, throughout uh United States jurisprudence, um, it's been decided. Um, it actually arises, the courts have found that it arises from the right of self-determination. Um, and it's not necessarily a privacy right, and it's obviously nowhere near a, you know, enumerated right in the Constitution, um, but it is a right, the courts have found, a right of liberty. And it actually arises from the same principles of, that gave rise to the concept of medically informed consent. Um, so basically both um, rely on this, this idea that you have a right um, to protect yourself from unwanted touching or undesired touching. Um, so you have this kind of body autonomy. And so you as a, as a person, whatever your religious beliefs, if your religious beliefs say that you do not need X um, medical treatment, usually we see this with blood transfusion is, is the, the biggest example. Um, the, the court will look at for this medical treatment, whether the patient is an adult or minor. Um, if you're a competent adult, um, you're allowed to refuse medical treatment on the basis of religious grounds, um, even if the circumstances are dire. It becomes a little more tricky when you're dealing with a child and especially when parents or guardians are making decisions on behalf of their children. Um, here you'll usually see a hospital or doctors um, take the parents to court to intervene and, and perform life-saving surgery um, on the child. The court will look at um, whether the um, child needs immediate attention, um, whether the attention that they need is the medical care they need is remedial um, or elective. I, in other words, whether it can be avoided. Um, they'll also look to see if there's an alternative, if there's some way that the religious grounds can be respected um, and the patient's life be saved. And you see that here in The Mandalorian. You see that IG-11 reminds him that he's not a human. So technically, by IG-11 performing the medical treatment, he's found a way to honor Din's religious beliefs, but also perform the life-saving surgery. So everyone leaves the room, the robot and droid is the only one that sees his face. And so a human has never seen his face and he's not breaking his religious vows. Um, so it's, it's very, you know, very close to what would happen um, in real life. I find it supremely lucky that Holowan Lab IG-11 thought enough to put a, a back to application spray into their assassin droid. <laughs> like he, he might, or, I, what I like is the idea that IG-11 installed it himself. So if he encountered and shot a, a bounty that needed to be brought in alive, he could keep it, you know, just spray him with a little back and keep him alive just long enough to collect that. Bounty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and the back to spray is honestly like the, 
the travel neosporin like everybody should have <laughs> the back to spray on them like you don't need the giant like the advertising builds itself you don't need the giant back to tank you have the to go well, dunk yourself when you can <laughs> take one spray yeah. I, I i counter maybe it was bill who installed that that's a good part of, yeah that's part of being a nurse droid but that's us playing fans as opposed to lawyers but <laughs> just, just an idea. Let's talk about the uh, what I what is one of them probably, and it's because it hits the big issue of doing the right thing, and that that's episode three, and it's the sin, because the sin was doing the right thing, and and it raises the issue of was there a duty to rescue the child after the Mandalorian gave the child to the client. You know, the former Imperials, the who don't realize that the war is over or that they're very upset that they lost the revolution and they're still hanging on to their beliefs that their way of life was better. And, you know, you see, this is the only time that you see the child cry in the series is, is when the stormtroopers taking him away. And when it comes to the duty of rescue, Generally speaking, there is no duty to rescue. We don't have a hue and cry uh, requirement of, you know, saying like, hey, stop thief and people have to drop what they're doing and, and go go to somebody's aid. If you see someone <laughs> drowning, you have no duty to go rescue them. And that's just because we it would be a super complicated world if we had that. Well, when you look at what happens in this episode, you can have a duty to rescue if there's a special relationship, and that could be like parent-child, or it can arise when one party is entrusted with the well-being of another individual. Well, if you, you know, rescue a kid from a bunch of mercenaries, you know, that arguably starting to create a special relationship because you're caring for that child. And, and another situation is when you have a custodial relationship to another. Well, you know, when you're caring for an infant, even if it's a 50-year-old infant, you know, you have that custodial type relationship there. Uh, there's another theory that it's defense of others. That if you see someone who is in imminent lethal uh, peril, that you can go aid them. And, and that gets very fact specific. Well, mm -hmm. you have, you know, Mando who is clearly thinking about this because he's asking questions, you know, to the client and then to grief, you know, like, what do you think they're, they're doing with him? Why are the Imperials here? And it's him getting into his ship and reaching for the lever where, you know, the, the ball bearing was taken off by the child and he freezes. And that's pure Star Wars, because it's him realizing this is morally wrong, and I'm going to go save that kid and go kill a bunch of space Nazis. Mm -hmm. And and I think go on. No, I think too, Josh. I think it's it's also there's another theory um, that's at play, which is the idea um, that when you put somebody in danger you have a dude and you prevent others from rescuing. If you put somebody at risk, you have a, you, it creates a duty to you if you know about that risk to um, save that person. So I think that's part of what he's realizing is he's left them with these space Nazis and that may not be a great idea. <laughs> so he's kind of put him in danger. And I think when he gets back to the ship, he's realizing the danger that he's put him in and it, it creates this sense of duty and, and, to rescue him. Yeah. Well, and how can you not love this cuddly, like this cuddly little guy? He did save your life, you know, from the um, mud, from the mud uh, horn. And so, I mean, <laughs> come on, like, how can you not love this little face with those eyes, those little eyes? Yeah, it's well. Like those you of us just have the in there. Yeah. Those of us who argue for the rule of law don't <laughs> normally idea. say lock and load, but this is one of those situations. Lock and load. Save the kid. You know, and, and good luck arguing to the jury, well, it was wrong for them to kill the war criminals who were going to do experiments on the child. No one's going to go, you're right. 
Those poor stormtroopers. They didn't, they didn't even have a chance. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, yeah, no, they're, it's not a sympathetic plaintiff in that situation. Speaking of stormtroopers, <laughs> let's talk about those uh, war criminals who still have nice, fancy-looking <laughs> uniforms and uh, apparently didn't know that uh, Jakku happened and that they surrendered. Uh, Thomas, being the JAG officer, can you help us understand these issues? Yeah, so I'll I'll tee this up uh, both with an in canon uh, like place setting and then sort of the framework. So if you if you're unaware, uh, right, this is set five years after Return of the Jedi. About a year after the Return of the Jedi, you have the Battle of Jakku, backbreaking event for the Galactic Empire. Shortly after Jakku, Masa Meda, who you may remember from the prequels, the blue uh, Shagrian who sits alongside the Emperor, uh, he sits proxy emperor and in his capacity as uh, the stand-in emperor, he signs what's called the Galactic Concordance, the peace accord with what's now become the New Republic. Uh, that ends all hostilities. It confines the what's left of the empire to a set of a uh, few worlds near the core. Uh, they are disarmed or largely disarmed. Uh, any remaining Imperials that continue to take up arms against the New Republic or the galaxy at large are considered criminals writ large. And so uh, that's the environment that you see uh, all of this play out in. And when we talk about war crimes in general, uh, the, the law of war itself, uh, it, it seems, I always say it seems oxymoronic to say that there's a body of law governing something as chaotic and destructive as war. But the, the law of war, the law of armed conflict, as it's called, is probably one of the oldest sets of, of laws, you know, the amalgamations of custodies or uh, um, uh, customary treaties, international law, those sorts of things uh, that we have in this world. It's a, a body of law that's evolved over millennia. And the idea is that we want to put a, a few ground rules in place to try to limit the destruction. And so what you see if you study the law of war, law of armed conflict, is after each destructive conflict that we have, uh, society sort of comes together and agrees upon additional rules to, to, to try to limit that sort of destruction that we just came out of. And so when we talk about war crimes in general, that's a phrase that's used all, all the time in, in uh, pop culture. It's, it's used here um, as talking in that bar on uh, Navarro as they're under siege from Moff Gideon, they, they throw out the word uh, like war criminal. Like, hey, this guy's a war criminal. I thought he was dead. Um, but what that means is it, he's committed specific crimes, right? And the law of war outlaws certain things. It outlaws things like murder. It outlaws things like the intentional targeting of civilians, uh, torture, mistreatment of prisoners. There's a whole body. Not everything is treated on the same level of seriousness, just like uh, in, in um, you know, the, the rest of the law. There, there are different types of crimes. You know, murder is not quite treated the same as petty larceny. Um, that's not to say there's like war crimes light and war crimes heavy, but you know, something like a genocide is going to be different than slapping a prisoner around. Both are war crimes, but they're, they're just treated mm -hmm. sort of categorically mm -hmm. different here. And, and this is which I'll turn it over to the group. Uh, we have some real war crime, like war crimey things that they get tossed around. For <laughs> like a very legal term. Um, we, we hear about, we hear that, Moff Gideon is a member of the ISB, <coughs> the, in, the Imperial Security Bureau. <coughs> Excuse me. We hear that he was involved in something called the Night of the Thousand Tears and the Great Purge. <laughs> Neither of which sound like very <laughs> nice events. No. No. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's going to be Exhibit A uh, to an indictment of yeah, you killed kids? What What's going on here? So he sounds like a super bad man who, again, is going after Vader's record and killing his own guys. So you interrupt him, you get shot. I don't know if Vader ever did that. He <laughs> might have been so... Yeah, but not for well, interrupting. Out. So coming out of hyperspace early, sure. Apologizing for losing the Millennium Falcon definitely killed somebody there 
but not for like, excuse me, Lord Vader, and then choke the dude. Yeah. Like, well, for disagreeing with him, yes. I haven't read all the comic, but I don't think that's happened. That said, uh, <laughs> this, he's a bad man. So uh, he's, he's definitely putting the imp in Imperial for being able to kill and get what he wants. Uh, so if he did genocide with his purge on Mandalore and with the Night of a Thousand Tears, sounds like it had a high body count and they ravaged- At least a thousand. Yeah. And then they, <laughs> and then they ravaged the countryside for Beskar. So all bad, all bad. Uh, so Thomas, if, you know, if you were going to play Justice Jackson at a, uh, war crimes trial, uh, a la Nuremberg, <laughs> what would your main arguments be? Well, exhibit A is that black cape. I mean, you don't, you don't wear a black cape like that if you're not a war criminal. Like, you know. <laughs> You're, or you're, you're going to the Met Gala. Yeah, no. That's like the only That's two times. Cool. Met Gala or War Criminal. Hey, you could be... That's right. Or you're the Phantom of the, <laughs> the Phantom of the Empire. He's just still lurking. <laughs> and, or Severus Snape. He has a kid too. <laughs> I keep bringing a Harry Potter. Sorry. But well, I don't know. So <laughs> the, the Empire did a lot of bad things. Wiped out all Alderaan. Uh, enslave people, uh, entire species like the Wookiees. But I don't know that we we know of sort of a categorical genocide like what is suggested with the Mandalorians. I mean, the, the implication is that they broke the back of these people as a whole. And I understand, you know, it's a creed, um, not a religion, so, or, or, you know, it's a, a specific identifying factor. But if we're talking about system and and certainly it had people that were considered mandalorians as well as its moons like concord dawn and concordia if they were wiping out mandalorians writ large and and in doing so uh, you know we're, we're cleansing those planets for for uh, lack of a, a more awful term i guess um he wouldn't have even had to, to be pulling the trigger actively on mandalorians to, to be front and center for a war crimes trial. Just look in the recent weeks, there's a, a Nazi uh, former uh, concentration camp uh, prison guard that's on trial or was just convicted recently. And that seems to, every few years they find one and prosecute him. Uh, it, you know, they're all in their 90s, 80s and 90s at this point. But the point being, you know, all of these folks, these former Nazis, just as by way of example, weren't all the masterminds. They weren't at the top of the Third Reich coming up with this awful dastardly plan. Um, you know, these were lower level folks, but they were involved and they were, you know, a cog in that awful, awful machine. And Moff Gideon, certainly by virtue of his rank, his status, uh, and, and just the authority that he commands, as well as his position in the ISB, certainly fits the profile of somebody who had a prominent role in that, uh, you know, that genocide. And I think absolutely he would be a high value target for the new Republic to go after, put on trial very publicly and show to the galaxy that this sort of thing can't sort of person won't be allowed to go free. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to note whatever this, um, you know, night of a thousand tears was, and like you said, systematic wiping out of um, the Mandalorians, um, falls squarely within the definition of genocide, which is the systematic killing and elimination of a certain group of people. And one of those things is based on race, or I'm sorry, based on religion. And so that's what they did. They wiped out an entire group, a segment of a population based on their religion or creed. Um, so I think, you know, that he's immediately guilty of that amongst a handful and a plenty of other things. Yeah, few bad guys show up and list the war crimes that they've done in order to say, mess with me, I will you. That's, yeah. it, it's again- I'm not some is, lesser war crimes to, sh to make my point. <laughs> I don't know if he felt, you know, envy to Tarkin, but I mean, um, this is, I think the second moth that we've seen on screen and they, they really have zero patience 
for anyone being, you know, insolent to them and no qualms in wiping out mass populations of people. So and let's look. Let's also not forget that he's wielding at the end of the, the final episode of the series, one of the most important cultural artifacts to the Mandalorian people in the Darksaber. So the idea that, that Moff Gideon is just somebody that's puffed out his chest and is playing bad guy in a vacuum and has, has just taken advantage of a, a lack of leadership that's out there is false. He had a central role. He didn't come by that particular weapon with that the sort of significance that's attached to the dark saber by happenstance. Yeah, and uh, oh look, a question. Uh, Very true. Are there war crime laws that cover artifacts, relics? Well, yeah, and we we actually had a real world example of that when our president threatened to blow up Iranian cultural sites. Um, that would be a war crime, and which was why that was walked back pretty quickly because we don't do that. Uh, you also so, had yeah. Hobby Lobby got in trouble. They were, they were uh, found to be in possession of a number of Iraqi and Palestinian uh, cultural artifacts that it's not a war crime for them to have bought it, but it, it was for folks to, the, whoever stole it in the first place and, and they stole it because they took advantage of a, a, uh, you know, combat, situation conflict uh that, that left the door open to be able to steal an artifact like this uh that that was one that, that came in the news recently and prosecuted for stealing uh stuff in in both the uh persian gulf war and in in the early 90s and in operation iraqi freedom as we swept into baghdad you know there were circumstances and not widespread ones but you know the U.S. forces would take over a palace, say, um, you know, you, you got a lot of ornate stuff in there. You can't just take stuff off the battlefield, even if it's nice. And even if you're the the, the victor, um, you know, I personally prosecuted um, an officer that was uh, that had smuggled some AK-47s out. So it's not always like nice, you know, gilded stuff that gets out and gets people in trouble. It, it could be very simple things. He's not a soldier anymore <laughs> because of that. You should clarify that. We won. <laughs> Good. And, and it, it, it leads you to believe, like, what other artifacts is Moff Gideon hiding? Because um, obviously somebody who takes one artifact, especially in his position, and as evil as he seems to be, um, does not seem to be the person that would take just one. Um, so I hope we get a, a cut of, like, his his palace or shrine or hidey hole that he has and he has you know some goodies some deep cuts it it'd be like the you know with thrawn in rebels and the uh, very nice black series release that they did a few years ago at san diego san, san diego comic-con that actually had the uh, grail uh in it as well so um again lots of deep cuts but uh, it does raise interesting questions for how are they funded? Like you don't have nice uniforms, TIE fighters, uh, E-webs, you know, like just lying around. And all those soldiers can't be there because they just believe in the cause that they still got to be getting a paycheck somehow. They still have to be well fed. So, you know, this isn't like the, the stories of... Uh, you know, Japanese soldiers after World War II hanging out in the Philippines and, you know, for 50 years missing their lives because they didn't want to believe that the war was over. This is, they're organized and they're sustaining themselves somehow. So it would be... Well, uh, grief well, cargo. Yeah. Grief, grief brings up that point. He says, once you cut off their paycheck or their source of money, they'll scatter. And that doesn't... They, they seem like this might be a vein of Imperials that are particularly, um, you know, fervent in their belief. Why they weren't part of the Emperor's contingency and why they aren't on their way currently to the uh, the unknown regions where the, uh, the the most loyal of the Imperials are hiding, I don't know. It's also possible, we saw in the, the first Darth Vader comic, uh, where Vader, to finance his own sort of secret plans, was actively going after criminal organizations and stealing their money. Um, that could be a situation where he's operating on the fringes of the galaxy and he's just stealing from other bad guys, paying his books and keeping them happy. 
Yeah, yeah, that they're pirates, but they should be, uh, again, it's very, it'll be interesting to see if they explore that. Because on one level, you know, the view of that would be, say, the Colossus and Resistance, that that was a thriving economy ecosystem, uh, as opposed to uh, something that's just guys on a deserted island, not aware that the war is over. They clearly know that there's been a concordance and they're still fighting. And I don't know if that makes it like the Confederates who went to South America to, to live out the rest of their lives upset that they couldn't own slaves anymore. Uh, yeah. uh, traitors. So, I mean, may, maybe they're, to throw a divisive opinion in there, maybe they're related to Palpatine. Maybe this was all his plan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna like throw that one in there. <laughs> that, that's very possible considering their target. <laughs> yep. Gideon clearly knows the uh, importance of the child, probably because he knew of the Jedi, because again, that wasn't a secret. He had to know of Yoda and, and know the importance of someone of a member of that species being uh, powerful in the Force. So we still don't know what his ultimate end game is. Uh, but we can assume it's not good. And, uh, but again, wonderful issues. So we have just a couple minutes left. Uh, I did share the link that has the video to the mock guardianship hearing that Judge uh, Emily Spears presided over and multiple law students argued, and it was glorious. Uh, it, yes, it was absolutely a riot. It's very nice. And, um, uh, there was. It's important to know it was before COVID. It was way before. So it was last weekend. <laughs> it's uh, been so. eighty four years. <laughs> yeah. So we, we went out with a bang. So uh, yeah, we uh, San Diego Comic Fest was over the weekend of March eighth, and so and it was just right after that that the lockdown began. <laughs> so we just um, just made it. Yeah, just made it. So does, are there any other questions that people might have for us? Now, while people might be typing in, we do have uh, podcasts on each episode that Gabby, Thomas, and I recorded. And in-depth analysis, uh, like law school type uh, exam worthy. Um, on our YouTube channel, we also have uh, the did with CP30 and R2D2 suing the cantina for discrimination and also the court martial for Poe Dameron, uh, which, yes, uh, that was tons of fun. Another awesome one. And uh, so, yes, uh, so is the Bounty Hunter Code a legal document? You know, I do need, I, that's in my Amazon uh, wish list. I need to actually buy that and actually take a look at it. So, you mean the, the Bondsman Guild Protocol? Subparagraph yeah. thirteen. <laughs> it, it it might be professional standards. It might not be a legal document, but it could be you know required for licensing. So we'll uh, uh, might be an employee handbook. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I got the imperial That's one. There's lots of good on. stuff in there. Uh, but yeah, I'll definitely uh, we'll get that before season two drops. Uh, so with that, uh, we are just about out of time, and I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank the folks at Force Fest uh, who worked so hard to put this together, and uh, yeah, we we all have one now. Um, and uh, and to uh, uh, and to you know oh, donate to make do. a wish to, to help <laughs> those in need have positive experiences. So with that, uh, thank you all. Uh, we've been getting, we have our own show Friday night thank today. You. So we're right now covering Lower Decks and legal issues in Lower Decks uh, for those who also like Star Trek. And uh, we are getting ready for uh, a lot more as fall begins and we have TV shows. Mm -hmm. So you want to go around the horn on social media handles? Great. Uh, Gabby, where can people find you better? At Gabby the Esquire on Twitter. Thomas. This is the most creative handle in the history of Twitter. <laughs> At Thomas L. Harper. You're welcome. <laughs> Being an elderly person over there, Thomas. 
<laughs> My password is password. <laughs> <laughs> At, uh, Megan, I don't know how active you are on Twitter, but you do have one of. Uh, you know what? I, I don't even know what my handle is on Twitter. I have no idea. You've got uh, a rare treat with me. <laughs> uh, you can also follow The Legal Geeks uh, on all social media at The Legal Geeks and visit us at uh, thelegalgeeks.com. And my personal uh, Twitter is at Bowtie Law because I wear bow ties when I'm not wearing Star Wars t shirts. And with that, everyone, thank you. We'll keep the room open for a couple minutes, but uh, we're about to hit the closing ceremony. So I uh, encourage everyone to switch over to the closing ceremonies. Thank Thanks you all. Thanks for coming. Bye. Adieu. Bye. <laughs>